Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's keynote webinar titled A New Castle Disease Virus-Based COVID-19 Vaccine. This webinar is part of the 8th Coronavirus Virtual Event Series, and I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots. So let's get started. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that this event is interactive and we encourage you to first participate by communicating with other attendees using the live chat feature during the presentation. You can find that live chat located on the left of your screen. You can also participate by presenting some questions during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the ask a question box and click submit. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Now, if you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, simply click on that help desk button located at the top of your screen within the navigation bar or from the lobby. And finally, as a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credits. Click on that continuing education credits link located in the abstract window below the presentation window and follow the process to obtain those credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Adolfo Garcia Gastre, professor at the Department of Microbiology and Medicine at the Tisch Center Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. For a complete biography of our speakers, please visit the presenter tab from the menu at the left of your screen. Dr. Garcia Sastre, welcome. You may now begin your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can see now my screen. Um, uh, glad to be here. I participated in some other previous seminars. I'm gonna give you an update about um, a vaccine that we are developing, uh, we meaning myself, together with uh, another three professors here in Mount Sinai, uh, Peter Palese, Florian Kramer, and Wina San, which is based on a novel uh, vector, um, this Newcastle disease virus. I will explain a little bit what this viral vector is about. And um, before anything, I just want to show my disclosures uh, for potential conflict of interest. Now, the the vaccines that we have against COVID-19, there are many. Um, the ones that are more used right now, especially in the United States, are the RNA vaccines, either the messenger RNA, either the Pfizer or the um, Moderna vaccine. And these vaccines have really make a great impact in mitigating the severe disease, the hospitalizations and the deaths caused by SARS-CoV-2. They are highly protective against severe disease, uh, and that really has helped it a lot. But they are not um, completely optimal, um, and there are still a few problems with the vaccines. So again, they are really very good for protecting from severe disease, which is the most important thing. But there are two scientific problems that are not solved right now in COVID-19 vaccination. The first one is that the virus changed more quickly than updating the vaccine. So we started with the Wuhan-like viruses, the ones that came from the outbreak in Wuhan, that they spread all over the world. And soon enough, they started to appear variants. They were calling variants first and then variants of concern if they were uh, increasing in the number of infections that they cause. And these are um, mutants, they contain mutations. So they are slightly different from the previous Wuhan strain. And these mutations, what they do is they make the virus even more transmissible than it was before. We need to remember that this is a virus that this was not a human virus. So the first um, Wuhan and uh, Wuhan-like strains, despite transmitting very well in humans, they were not transmitted as well as they could. Uh, uh, and the additional mutations that the virus has acquired, they have helped it even to increase transmission. So the first one that we have is this D614G that now is present in every uh, of the isolates that they are um, of, of the of the virus. That was a mutation in the spike that increased affinity for the human receptor. And then they came the variants alpha, beta, gamma, uh, that they completely displaced the previous the previous uh, variants, the Wuhan-like strains, in different parts of the world. And these contain mutations in the receptor binding domain of the spike 
that evade some of the antibody responses, especially they were concerned, concerning especially for monoclonal antibody therapy, because some of the monoclonal antibodies, they were not able anymore to neutralize some of the alpha, beta, or gamma strains because of these mutations that they have. Um, these ones, they were displaced by delta that contained another set of mutations that also uh, uh, evaded some of the of the pre-existing immunity, but uh, all these there were a small number of mutations till now, uh, not very dramatic. Things changed uh, with Omicron when it came; it contains a, a large number of mutations. Was probably the first um, variant of concern that came with uh, because it was immune escaping. The previous ones and they were immune escaping a little bit. The mutations probably were selected based on increasing binding for, to the receptor, which in addition changed some of the antigenic size of the virus. Omicron came with a lot of mutations, so it was clear that it was uh, due to immune pressure. Uh, and it came at a time where there was already a large amount of people that they were either vaccinated or infected with previous strains. And uh, this uh, took us by surprise. Um, but Omicron continues changing. So right now, um, the vaccine that is recommended for um, getting a new, a, new, um, a new boost is a bivalent vaccine, contains both Wuhan, and what at the moment of making the bivalent vaccine was the most prevalent Omicron strain, which is the BA5. And although this is the case, still uh, there is already some variants that are different from BA5, that seems to be increasing in, in numbers. So um, the virus is changing more quickly than what the what the vaccine, uh, updating the vaccine is. Still, the vaccines are very good for protecting against, against uh, severe disease, but um, between a, a drop with time of the antibodies induced by the vaccine, plus these changes that the virus is going, then this makes uh, the need for revaccinations important and also the revaccinations are not completely matched, so they are still able to prevent severe disease, but they have the second problem, which is that they are not able to optimally prevent infections, mild disease, and transmissions, meaning that there is still a lot of virus circulating that can go into people that have more risk of severe disease. So that's the second problem. Um, the vaccines that we have, they have, uh, they got very good in inducing systemic antibodies neutralize the virus. These systemic antibody, antibodies go to the lung that is well irrigated and prevent replication of the virus in the lung. And this replication of the virus in the lung is what the virus needs to start to produce severe disease. From the lung, it can go to other organs and also in the lung can cause a lot of problems. Uh, however, the disease, the, the infection starts not in the lung, the infection starts in the upper respiratory tract. and is the virus that replicates in the upper respiratory tract that is either an asymptomatic infection or a mild infection, what the symptoms that they do, if it doesn't go down to the lung, is this the virus that transmit? So then the vaccines are not uh, protecting very well against transmission, and that means that there is still a lot of circulating virus. So why is that? Well, if we have a natural infection, the infection starts, as I mentioned, in the upper respiratory tract, maybe goes uh, down to the lung and, and maybe also cause severe disease. But this stimulates uh, the immune system in the respiratory tract, both in the upper and also, and also systemically. And that results in antibodies, systemic antibodies that protects the lung, plus um, local antibodies in the upper respiratory tract, secretory IgA, that protects against infection with the, the virus because they encounter the virus first. The vaccines that we have, they are all intramuscular, and that means that they will not stimulate well the, the, the uh, immunity in the upper respiratory tract. They stimulate very good systemic immunity, and these circulating antibodies that they induce, they are able to reach the lung well, so they protect against infection in the lung against severe disease but not so much against infection in the upper respiratory tract. So they don't protect so much against infection, against mild symptoms, and against transmission. Now, one will envision that perhaps if they will have intranasal vaccines, vaccines that are delivered in the upper respiratory tract, 
that this will induce this type of local immunity that is required for preventing also infections and transmission. So that's a possible solution. Um, the, there is a lot of interest in the developing of mucosal vaccines that protect better than the existing ones against um, infection and transmission. Obviously, if you prevent against infection, you also prevent against severe disease. And uh, that's what I'm going to talk about, about uh, an approach that is a vaccine that can be also be used intranasally, and therefore, in theory, it may be able to get better protection against um, infection and transmission than the vaccines that we have right now. So the strategy of vaccination that we're using is using a viral vector. So viral vector vaccines have been made also for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the ones that have been widely used are the adenovirus vaccines. That's the, the uh, Johnson & Johnson, the J&J &J vaccine, as well as the AstraZeneca vaccine. And some of the vaccines that have been used in other parts of the world, uh, uh, like the Sputnik vaccine, the Russian vaccine, and some of the Chinese vaccines are also based on adenovirus vectors. The vector that we are using is not an adenovirus, it's a different virus. It, adenovirus are DNA viruses. Uh, the vector that we are using is a Newcastle disease virus. Uh, what is Newcastle disease virus? Newcastle disease virus is a virus that is an RNA virus. So the genome is RNA, as opposed to adenoviruses that they have a genome that is DNA. And uh, this is a virus that uh, infects and causes problems in chicken. So it's a disease that is called Newcastle disease. Uh, it can be a very devastating disease in chickens. It was recognized since the 50s that this was a problem uh, for raising chickens so that they could get uh, this disease and then the, the chickens will die and then that's obviously it's very bad for the farmer. So um, already in the 50s, they have, they have been developing or there is already existing that they were developing in the 50s, vaccines for chicken against Newcastle disease. And these vaccines were based on a strain of Newcastle disease virus that antigenically is very similar to the ones that they cause severe disease, but that is a strain that does not cause uh, disease in chicken. So chickens have been immunized all over the world with Newcastle disease virus vaccines based on a strain of Newcastle disease virus that does not cause disease, but these induce antibodies in chickens and protected from the virulent forms of Newcastle disease. Now, uh, the virus, Newcastle disease virus, is an avian virus, is unable to cause disease, and it only induces a very small number of infections uh, or, the, or cycles of replication in mammals. And the reason is because this virus knows how to, like other viruses, how to navigate the innate immune system in order to be able to propagate in a host. And, but they, they're able to navigate the innate immune system of avian species. The mammalian innate immune system is slightly different from the avian, and this avian virus is unable to prevent a good innate immune response in mammals, and this makes that is uh, uh, unable to cause disease and unable to replicate multiple cycles. But it's able to get in uh, our cells and deliver uh, a cargo, a RNA, that's the genomic RNA. So it's, it's, one can think that it's a little bit like the RNA vaccines. You have an RNA that is uh, encapsulated now into a virus, not into a nanoparticle, and this one delivers the RNA inside the cells. And then this RNA express, if you, you make it express the spike protein, express the spike protein, similar to the, to the mRNA vaccines. Now, this illustrates, for example, here we have um, three different viruses, Newcastle disease virus over NDV, dengue virus, and influenza virus. And these, uh, and, and these are uh, human dendritic cells, the ones that initiate innate immune responses as well as adaptive immune responses. They need to be stimulated in order to get good antibodies and T cells. They will be the ones that will present antigen to B cells and T cells. And uh, there was an experiment that with Ana Fernandez Sesma, where she compared if uh, when they you stimulate human disease with either Newcastle disease virus or dengue virus, it's a human virus or influenza human virus. What you can see is the chemokines and cytokines that have been induced in disease 
that are important for stimulating the ability of this disease to present antigen. They are very highly induced in Newcastle disease virus, but not so much in dengue and influenza. That means that Newcastle disease virus in this assay uh, is an indication that has probably very potent immunogenic properties, able to stimulate very well the dendritic cells as opposed to other viruses like dengue or influenza. And this makes it an ideal vaccine vector. It's safe in mammals, does not induce disease, but it's highly immunogenic. So what advantages there could be of, of a vaccine based on, on Newcastle disease virus expressing now the spike protein, like uh, all the vaccines that we have around um, uh, from the existing vaccines? Well, first of all, it's safe. Um, the virus has been tested already in humans, especially because it, there have been some attempts, and they are still ongoing, to be used as an anti-tumor agent. And because of that, it has been used to treat cancer patients, and they have not been uh, seen adverse events. As I mentioned, it's highly immunogenic, and it can be used as a live platform or as an inactivated platform, as I will, I will show you later. It can be administered intranasally, and that means that you may be able to get this mucosal immunity that lacks right now the existing vaccines. It can be produced, so the Newcastle disease vaccines, they are being produced for chicken, and they are produced actually using the same um, technique that is being used for producing the majority of the influenza virus vaccines. That means that any um, influenza vac virus vaccine manufacturing uh, uh, building can be used to manufacture Newcastle disease virus vaccines. And there is many countries, including developing countries, that co contain their own facilities to produce their own influenza uh, vaccines. And they can actually then produce also Newcastle disease vaccines. Um, they have been growing in environment X, the same thing as influenza virus, and that allows them for more easy administration, more easy uh, sharing of this vaccine vector than all the vaccine vectors that we have. There is no issues with vector immunity in humans, meaning that the vector is able to um, deliver without being neutralizing humans by pre-existing immunity because Newcastle disease virus does not infect humans, um, so we don't have antibodies against it. And it's stable at 2, 4 degrees centigrade, so, which is an advantage also versus the existing vaccines that uh, all, of the, all of them require uh, congelate, uh, freezing temperatures uh, before being administered. Um, the strain changes for variants in the vaccine can be easily accommodated if it's needed. And um, this is more or less how we look uh, to these vectors. So we have it here on the on the right, we have the Newcastle disease virus-based vaccine. As you can see, it's like a virus particle, but contains incorporated the spikes um, of SARS-CoV-2 into the virus particle, and also contains an RNA genome, which is inside the virus, in which we have inserted the gene that encodes the spike. So in this respect, it looks a little bit like the messenger RNA-based vaccine that has an RNA that encodes the spike, but it doesn't have a spike proteins around, and also like the protein-based vaccines, that they have spikes, but they don't have an RNA that will now also uh, be delivered and then produce more spikes in anti-presenting cells. So we think that it um, combined two technologies, the ones of the mRNA-based vaccines, because it's an RNA virus, and the ones that are protein-based vaccines, because it has the protein incorporated into the envelope of the virus. Now, the spike that we use, for expressing in the virus is a is a stabilized spike. It's not the wild type of spike, and it has been stabilized by different mutations uh, that makes the protein more immunogenic and more stable. Uh, the furin cleviside that is, is is typical of this virus has been eliminated, and that means that it will be more difficult for this spike to uh, undergo conformational changes. There have been six problems that have been described by. Um, a group in Texas, in the University of Texas, that um, uh, stabilize also the the right conformation of the protein. Uh, that's the group of McLellan. And uh, we have inserted one more modification, and this is the transmembranes of the plasmic tail that are not important for the um, induction of antibodies, but they are important for anchoring the, the spike into membranes. They have been replaced by the transmembranes of the plasmic tail of the NDBF protein. And what this does now, it allows incorporation of this spike 
into the viral envelope of Newcastle disease virus, uh, so that it shows already these virus-like particles, it shows um, um, the presence. And that's different from adenovirus vectors, that they don't have the spike incorporated into the virus particle, is only expressed when they deliver the cargo DNA into cells. All right, so, so what we do, we have, this is the, up here, what we have in black, is the genome, uh, RNA genome of Newcastle disease virus that encodes all the viral proteins of Newcastle disease virus. We add one more protein, this uh, stabilized exapro spike, and then we, we rescue virus uh, that contains now uh, the spike incorporated into the RNA genome, so it will express this spike when the RNA genome is being delivered into cells, as well as has the spike, as I mentioned, incorporated into the virion envelope. And one can see this spike easily in Comasi gels that are here at the bottom of the slide. Uh, you look to wild type NDV, you, you can see in purified virions, all the proteins of the virus. And if you look to the NDV, uh, the one that expresses the NDVS, there is one protein here in blue, the S, that you see very clearly now in this Comasi gel. Uh, is the right molecular size and is more or less the same level as some of the glycoproteins uh, of the virus itself, like the HN protein that is one of the glycoproteins. So it's very well expressed in the in the, in the the virion, and that means that the virions themselves, even if they will not deliver the RNA to produce a spike, could be used as an immunogen. Now, how we use it as vaccine vectors? So um, we have this generated these viruses. We grow it like they've been grown, the influenza virus vaccines, in embryonary decks. And then they are being purified from these embryonic eggs where they grow very well because it's a chicken virus. And then you have two ways how to administer the vaccine, and we are exploring both ways. First one is we you inactivate it, and then you have a, a particle that contains the spikes, and, and you, use, you can use it then for intramuscular immunization, the same thing as the protein vaccines are being used, like for example, the Novavax vaccine. Um, or you can use it live because uh, it's, it's, it's live, and then you can use it intranasally in order to try to stimulate better mucosal immunity. It will both has the antigen in the virion as well as now in the case of the live virus, you will be able to deliver this RNA into cells and then express a spike and then stimulate also in this, such a way mucosal immunity. And hopefully you do some spike antibodies and people get protected. So uh, what do we know about it? We have done a lot of preclinical studies. We have used three animal models in which we see safety as well as immunogenicity and protection against challenge in the animal models where you can do a challenge. So these uh, are being mice that they have the human receptor, AC2, hamsters where actually can, you can replicate the virus. And we have it also in pigs as a, as a bigger animal. Pigs cannot be challenged by SARS-CoV-2 but at least you can measure neutralizing antibodies and you get very good neutralizing antibodies. In the mice and in the hamsters, we get very good protection. And we have tried three vaccination regimens, inactivated vaccines into um, uh, two sorts, like normally for the, for the normal vaccines. The first one, intramuscular, intramuscular, live vaccines, intranasal, intranasal, or live vaccine, intranasal, intramuscular. And the data that we have in, in these animals that is safe, is immunogenic and is protective against challenge. So this is, for example, one experiment that we did in which we did intramuscular vaccination in hamsters with the inactivated product, and then we, we challenged with SARS-CoV-2. Two immunizations, prime at day zero, boost at day 21, and then 18 days uh, later, we challenged with, uh, with SARS-CoV-2, with replication in hamsters and induced disease. First of all, you get uh, down here, good induction of antibodies that have been used even without adjuvant. They induce here in green, they induce very good levels of antibodies. You don't, use, you don't need to use an adjuvant. And then when we challenge, what we see is that here in the, the healthy controls are the black line. They don't lose weight or they lose a little bit weight in the beginning of the experiment but uh, these are not infected, so they are healthy. And then we see the, the red line, these are demonized animals, and they are also not losing weight, so they are being protected against disease uh, as compared to the controls, which are gray, that uh, get the body weight drop around 10% uh, of body weight drop. 
and then it will look to replication of the virus of the virus in these animals, vaccinated animals. All vaccinated animals they don't have viruses in the lung, in two different lobes of the of the lung, the the upper right lobe or the lower right lobe at day two as compared to controls, or at day five as compared to controls. So it's very good protecting from infection these these animals. Um, if we do intranasal vaccination, we get also very good levels of antibodies uh, in Sira, as well as very good protection here. The blue line is the one, the vaccinated animals, and that they have been challenged, they don't lose any weight, they look like the healthy controls. And when we look uh, to virus replication in these intranasally vaccinated animals, we also don't see replication of the virus in the lung at day two or at day five. But importantly, we also don't see replication of the virus in nasal washes in the upper respiratory tract, indicating that they have been protected not only against replication in the lung, but also replication in the upper respiratory tract by this intranasal immunization. <laughs> now, we have been exploring more the intranasal immunization in, in terms of what type of immune response will we use in mice um, that they have been, again, prime and then boost. Um, with different doses, 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6, two vaccinations, one vaccination using controls. And then we look uh, now to uh, serum antibodies, but also um, nasal antibodies, so IgA in the nasal secretions, IgA in the in the lung, and pulmonary T cell responses, presence of CD8 resident memory T cells. Um, when we do that, um, we see with uh, 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 5, two times, very good induction of anti S serum IgG, this is again intranasal immunization. If we look now to IgA, presence of IgA in nasal washes, we also see nice levels of IgA in nasal washes. Also, IgA present in the in the bronchia um, in, in using two different two different assays here. And um, we see that the second immunization boosts this IgA tyrus. And now if we look to uh, T cells, resident T cells, we see that the vaccination with the higher dose induce uh, uh, nice levels of uh, tissue resident CD8 positive cells in the lung, as well as in the bronchi. Now, if we immunize these mice and now we challenge them, not only with the homologous variant, but also with some of the variants that are different, like the uh, beta variant or like the uh, gamma variant, what we see is uh, there is good protection as also against challenge with variants. We did that uh, also uh, this before Omicron. With Omicron, we get also some protection, so that seems good. But uh, we get even better protection when we use multivalent vaccines um, uh, that are can be also be used in these animals. So all this preclinical data has resulted in, in launching clinical trials. We have been able to do so thanks to the help of nonprofit organizations like PATH, like the Gates Foundation, and the governments from different countries like Thailand, Vietnam, and Brazil that have been sponsoring the human clinical trials. Same thing with Mexico, and we are conducting also a clinical trial here in, in, in USA. So the ones that are more advanced are the ones in Thailand, Vietnam, and Brazil. They are all intramuscular, inactivated, so perhaps they are not so good for mucosal immunity, but at least we, we learn how this behave with respect to the other vaccines that we have. They are prime boost, intramuscular, They've been conducting phase one and phase two studies. In Thailand, what we have done is we gave him the seed vaccine and their GPO, um, which is a company in Thailand with the sponsor of the government has been able to manufacture the vaccine and to give the vaccine to the clinical trials. The same thing in Vietnam, the same thing in Brazil. And they have been conducting phase one, phase two in all, in all these uh, countries and phase three are starting to to hopefully to start soon. Uh, what we have learned from this uh, phase one, phase two studies, what we have learned is that we get very good induction of neutralizing antibodies. I will show you some data on that. And we have learned that is very safe. Uh, not only that, that is not reactogenic. So it induces less um, side effects than the mRNA vaccines or the adeno vaccines. 
Mexico, we are doing intranasal um, immunizations with the live vaccine. And there we have learned also that it's immunogenic and safe when using this modality. And the, in the U.S., we are also doing a boosting now, not the primary vaccination, <coughs> but a boosting vaccination intranasal to see whether we protect much better against um, infection and transmission. So these are the data of the phase one clinical trial in, in, in Thailand. There were different doses that we use, one micrograms, three micrograms or 10 micrograms. Without or with adjuvant, the best uh, response of neutralizing antibodies is with 10 micrograms. And if you compare it with mRNA vaccines, it looks like you get slightly better induction of neutralizing antibodies. Statistically, not significant, but it looks slightly better. So, non inferior with respect to the mRNA vaccines for induction of neutralizing antibodies. If we look to the data um, in, uh, in Vietnam, phase two, this one uh, there was uh, uh, 124 individuals that they, they received three micrograms, 125 that received six micrograms, and then a group that they received the AstraZeneca vaccine, 125. And when you look to induction of, of neutralizing antibodies, we get approximately double amount of neutralizing antibodies with the NDV vaccine as compared to the AstraZeneca adenovirus vaccine. Meaning in this case superior with uh, respect to induction of neutralizing antibodies than the AstraZeneca vaccine. But, you know, uh, this was using the, the Wuhan strain and uh, now we have uh, Omicron, uh, which is antigenically quite different from the, from the other strains. If we look to the uh, mutations that have been in the uh, receptor binding domain of the protein spike, they are the ones that will prevent uh, antibodies to bind to the protein and then neutralize it. Previous variants, they have one or three mutations that reduce some antibodies for binding, but there's still there is many other antibodies that they will bind. Um, however, the Omicron has a lot of mutations, and that makes uh, a reduction in the ability to neutralize uh, when you induce immunity against ancestral uh, strain, and then you, you compare it for ability to neutralize Omicron. Um, now, we need, uh, to address uh, the potential of these changes, one potential solution is to use multivalent vaccines. We have produced now Newcastle disease virus vaccines uh, that are based uh, not only in the Wuhan ancestral strain, but also in the beta, the gamma, and the delta um, strains, and more recently in Omicron. These are the, the vaccines that they were developing for beta, gamma, and delta um, in our lab. And um, uh, now we can combine it together into trivalent or tetravalent vaccines and see what type of immunity they induce when you have multiple spikes being present in the vaccine. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, they all, um, uh, all either immunization with ancestral um, or immunization with uh, with uh, trivalent and tetravalent that contains ancestral, they protect quite well against Wuhan challenge. Uh, against Delta challenge, um, then uh, the, the immunizations with Delta, they protect much better against Delta than the immunizations with ancestral, but the trivalent and tetravalent, they, they, they protect very well. And, uh, and against Mu, the same thing, trivalent and tetravalent protect very well. But the most interesting thing when we look to uh, neutralizing antibodies is that the ones that induce better levels of neutralizing antibodies against the multiple the different strains are the trivalent trivalent against the ancestral strain that is in the in the bottom uh, uh, right. The next one is delta, and is also the ones that induce better trivalent and tetravalent uh, administrations. Beta the same, but interesting Omicron that is not included in this multivalent vaccine. Again, the multivalent vaccine induces much better antibodies against Omicron than the monovalent vaccines. 
indicating that when you combine multiple spikes into the same strain, not only you get better immunity against all of these spikes, but also immunity against the spikes that are different. And perhaps it's because they are the, the immunization induced antibodies mainly against the most common regions of the spike. And these are the ones that are also shared by, by some of the strains like Omicron. So that's where we are right now. Uh, we hope to continue these clinical trials and see uh, how good it will protect, uh, especially against infection and transmission, uh, not only against severe disease. We are very confident that we'll protect well against severe disease because the levels of antibodies that we get. Um, the question is, will it protect better against infection or, or uh, transmission because of the intranasal modality? Uh, but this could be considered not only a vaccine, this, this vaccine strategy against SARS-CoV-2, but also against other different pathogens. Um, I talked talk today about Newcastle disease virus present SARS spike, but we have made also Newcastle disease virus present Ebola GP, expressing um, H5 or H7 proteins from hemagglutinins from highly pathogenic influenza virus with pandemic potential. Uh, against HIV, MV, or against Lassa virus uh, G. And uh, we we also trying to evaluate these ones with respect to infection of immune responses and to see whether NDV could be a good platform, vector platform for induction of, of multiple, uh, to be included in multiple vaccines. So in summary, uh, I show you how Newcastle disease virus or NDV vaccine vectors, uh, how we have developed these vectors that we have developed it against multiple human and veterinarian disease. We have actually vaccine that is being used in Mexico, uh, where uh, Newcastle disease virus expressing uh, hemagglutinin of an uh, avian influenza virus is being used as dual vaccine against Newcastle and against influenza in chicken. Um, I've shown you how an NDV expressing SARS-CoV-2 XAPRO is Induce potent protection from virus infection, both in lungs and nose of hamsters, after intranasal immunization. How immunized mice with NDV expressing SARS-CoV-2 XAPRO are protected against challenges with new variants, especially when we use uh, multivalent vaccines. And then uh, phase one and two trials that have been conducted in Vietnam, Thailand, Brazil, and Mexico. Mexico, again, we use a live modality, and it seems to be safe and immunogenic. Um, Phase three trials are about to start in uh, in Thailand mainly, and these data uh, indicate good safety and immunogenicity profiles. Uh, so, obviously, this is a big enterprise. Uh, so, multiple labs have been collaborating these uh, studies, as well as multiple institutions, especially uh, the governments of uh, Brazil. And this is Mutantan, GPO, and, and the government of Thailand, IVAC, and the, and the government of Vietnam, but also Avimex in Mexico, Dynavax for providing some adjuvant, the Gates Foundation, NIID, and uh, different funding agencies. So thanks, and uh, I will take questions. It's still important to get vaccinated uh, because immunity is waning and hopefully we'll get better vaccines even than the one that we have right now soon. Thank you, Dr. Garcia Gasastre, for that informative presentation. And we will now start the live Q&A <coughs> portion of this webinar. If you have any questions you want to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. So let's get started. It looks like we already have <coughs> some questions coming in. <clears throat> Our first question, how important are T cell responses for protection against SARS-CoV-2 infection? So that's, that's something that um, has been the, um, uh, studied in multiple labs. I think the best evidence have come from uh, the lab of, of uh, Dan Baruch using um, actually adenovirus vaccines where he sees if he immunizes monkeys with uh, 
and the virus vaccines and he deplete of T cells, these monkeys, then they are not as good protected against uh, infection. So neutralizing antibodies play a very important role, but T cells seem to contribute also to protection, especially against severe disease, perhaps not so much against infection because they eliminate infected cells, but against severe disease um, and further replication of the virus, they seem to be quite important. And the good thing is that the virus at least uh, despite having all these changes in uh, in a spike that uh, evade antibody immunity, it does not have changes in T cell epitopes. So there is still some protection that is being induced by the vaccine that is T cell mediated that has not changed. The only thing is that T cells alone are not able to prevent infections, the same thing as antibodies, systemic antibodies alone. They are not able to protect, to uh, prevent infections. Is this mucosal immunity what we need uh, in order to prevent infections and transmission? Thank you so much. And our next audience member asks: Can SARS-CoV-2 and influenza virus co-circulate? Okay, so we we have not seen too much co-circulation of SARS-CoV-2 with flu in the past. But most of it, we believe, is due to that the mitigation um, measures that they were put it in the multiple countries to try to reduce the number of infections work it actually better against flu than what was working against SARS-CoV-2. Perhaps because uh, with flu, we have already some pre-existing immunity that in addition to other mitigation, like uh, use of masks by, by multiple people, um, the social distancing, etc., has reduced a lot circulation of flu. Now, this seems to be over. So now flu is coming. In the past, there have been seen some co-infections between SARS-CoV-2 and influenza. Uh, how common this will be is unclear. Uh, the data there with a few co-infections that have happened in humans at least indicate that they are not more severe. So that's a good, that's a good sign. But obviously, circulating both viruses at the same time uh, can increase the number of cases that they need to be uh, hospitalized because you have already flu that causes a, a, a burden uh, every year. And some years are worse than others in terms of hospitalized people and whatever is still happening with SARS-CoV-2. So that may represent the problem. Uh, and that makes also important that people uh, get not only the updated SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, but also the flu vaccine to try to reduce as much as possible the, the infections with these two uh, pathogens in this winter that is coming. Thank you so much, Dr. Garcia Sastre. And I wanna thank our audience for these great questions that are coming in. Our next question, the NDV HXPS virus, either in whole or in part, any evidence that it crosses blood brain barrier or cross placenta into the fetus? And this refers to multivariant vaccines and even different administration methods. Yeah, so uh, the level of replication that we see of Newcastle disease virus in animals uh, as well that are not avian species because avian is different, they get more levels of replication. Um, because it's the avian virus, but in uh, animals, uh, in the preclinical, and now with the data that we are uh, getting from uh, uh, people, we actually cannot recover infectious viruses. So it looks like it gets in. We can detect RNA for a couple of days. We only can detect RNA in the upper respiratory tract, uh, and then and then it's gone. Um, uh, so it seems to be very deficient in terms of making infectious viruses, and it seems mainly to um, produce a spike locally in the places where it's been administered, both in the clinical trials, which is one of the things that we know now about it, but also in the in the animal models that we have used. Now, in, in chicken is different, uh, but in chicken, uh, the approach for the vaccination is that the vaccine virus is extremely attenuated, so it replicates, but that's not induced disease in chicken. Thank you so much. 
We have another question coming in. Is lumpy skin disease virus curable? And this is a two-part question. Are there, as there is no vaccine yet made, is it more dangerous than Newcastle disease and coronavirus? Well, I'm less familiar with this virus, so I cannot uh, actually uh, tell you uh, too much too much about it. Um, corona now are, are a big problem because of what happened with the pandemic. Um, and, uh, and but I, I know very little about the lumpy skin uh, disease virus. Dr. Garcia Sastre, I want to thank you for your presentation today. Would you like to provide any closing remarks for our audience before we go? Well, you know, I think the most important thing is that despite the fact that the vaccines can be improved, the vaccines are still the best way how to reduce the burden that this virus is, is causing. And because of this waning of immunity that happens, as well as the changes antigenically, it, people are much better off if they get now the bivalent vaccine in terms of boosting up, again, the levels of antibodies the higher than what it is right now with, uh, with natural infections or, or previous vaccinations uh, that will be able to uh, provide, at the end, better protection against the new variants that are circulating. And again, what I mentioned, uh, it's also important um, to reduce influenza burden in the community um, in order to protect our um, uh, high risk groups. Uh, so, um, and the vaccination can be done at the same time for uh, COVID-19 and for flu. Uh, and that's, that's the way it's how to get, you know, with a single uh, visit to the pharmacy, uh, getting the vaccination against the bivalent and against flu, um, that, that's, that's the ideal thing that people can do in order to protect much better themselves as well as the rest of the community. Well, I want to thank you again, Dr. Garcia Sastre, for your time and for your important research. And before we go, I want to thank our audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand for two years until October 19th, 2024. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care and bye-bye. Thank you.